Um, but if I can click through, here you can see in this photo a few wrapped hives. This was from a, a different overwintering experiment. And in this, we, we bought uh, corrugated uh, plastic black, uh, almost like cardboard boxes. It's sort of that, that material that they make campaign signs out of uh, that are black. We got in with a few other, with a commercial beekeeper that was ordering a bunch. And we said, hey, can you order a handful for us? And so we jumped in on that order. The more you buy, the less expensive they are. Um, but so that would be another example of, of wrapping your hive. But this is what I wanted to show. And this is what I did in January, um, mountain camp uh, feedings or uh, emergency uh, granular sugar feedings. So it was a warm enough day for me to go out to our hives, open them up. Uh, normally you would lay a sheet of newspaper down across the whole thing and then um, add some granular sugar on top. The idea is that uh, the bees are clustering towards the top. Maybe, um, maybe you'll have some more cold days ahead where they're not able to cluster around food. And so this is just some emergency food for them to feed, to feed on. I put a shim on on top of this and then put the lid on. This wasn't very much. This was only about four cups of sugar. I know that a lot of folks who do this do maybe twice that amount and maybe come back and do it again. Uh, I don't know if, do, if anyone wants to speak up about their experience with, with mountain camp feedings or emergency sugar feedings in the winter. Um, ours was a little bit successful. A few of our hives that we did this to, we still lost. Others, others are still going, so. I used this. I, I did pile more sugar on than that. Um, I, I put it in early. It was probably early December. And I mean, it was helpful for moisture right away. Um, but, you know, they barely touched it still. I think they must have honey stores underneath because they've barely touched the sugar itself. It's been mostly moisture control at this point. So, so for Nebraska and Iowa beekeepers, I, by the way, I live a little bit outside of Omaha. Um, it, is, can you make a generalization? Is, are, will you pretty much have to put in supplemental feed roughly this time of year? Is, is there... Do you just, should I just expect that, to, hey, I'm going to have to put supplemental feed in roughly this time of year to get bees through in a Nebraska, Iowa average winter if there is such a thing anymore? I, I think that a way that you could avoid this sort of emergency situation is just by uh, making sure your hives are good and heavy going into winter. So whether that means you harvest less honey and you leave a lot more honey frames in there for them, or you invest in uh, sugar syrup, you know, as soon as you get those honey supers off, your, your supplementary feeding, making sure that they get food stores uh, really high and you got them really heavy. The general rule of thumb is that um, you want your hives to be a good heavyweight around 100 to 120 pounds. Uh, if you've got two deeps on there, you want your hive to be 100 to 120 pounds going into winter. But even then, my hives were 100, were over, all over 100 pounds in October. But we had, my theory is that, well, we had a bad mite year, first of all. So mites were a problem. But then we had um, a really mild winter uh, that usually the temperatures get cold in October and they stay cold. But, but here they it got a little bit cold in October and then it didn't get, really get cold again until December. And I'm sure my bees were out foraging and using a lot more energy and eating a lot more. So by the time December rolled around and it really got cold, a lot of our food stores were already eaten up. And that was part of the reason I was worried. Um, one beekeeper I know that has really good overwintering success every year, he feeds his hives till they're 180 pounds each, uh, which was more than I've ever heard of. But uh, I know that's really helped him quite a bit. He, and so that, that's one consideration. So are these advocates of a single box brood chamber, just they're doing a single box and, and, and one of the YouTube videos I watch religiously is probably pronounced it wrong, but University of Guelph, Guelph, uh, yeah. and, and they're proponents of that. And uh, everybody so far that's presented has had two box, double deeps. So in, in Nebraska, is it really double deeps is the way to go into winter? I think it depends on the, the size of your colony. 
you know, we, we've overwintered singles, we've overwintered doubles, and we've overwintered, you know, triple boxes too. It, 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 you really want to look at how many, how much bees, the population of bees to food they need. Typically, we would overwinter in two deeps. Um, but sometimes, and we have done it when they're just so large that to take them down to two deeps would just, you wouldn't give them enough food. You know, they, they'd run out of reserves fairly quickly. So yeah, and there's other ways. Sometimes, sometimes you can avoid this emergency feed um, by reversing. Sometimes there's still food in the colony, but not accessible because they've already moved up to the top box, but plenty of food down below. So sometimes you can kind of reverse those boxes and shift the placement of those bees so that they can continue to move upward and go through their honey reserves. Uh, we also use candy boards and sometimes you can store those and just plop them on really fairly quickly. Uh, Luke could talk probably more about the candy boards than I can. Brad, this year in Iowa, I overwintered two that are a deep and a medium super on top of that. So it's smaller. It's not a single, but it's smaller than two doubles. Actually, I'm, I'm liking that better because I find they, I find the second deep, sometimes they don't get into as much as I'd like. So I'm, this year I might try just a deep and a medium and see how I do for the year. Um, I've never invested, I know we're supposed to be talking about spring and not winter today <laughs> because it's a little bit too late, uh, but I've never invested in candy boards before. So I would actually be interested in hearing Judy or Luke talk about what the, what you do at the UNL lab. Yeah. Um, so with the candy boards, uh, they're really nice. Basically they're, um, I think, let me see if I can, uh, actually when we get done talking about it, I'll, I'll share the link that I have on our um, Great Plains Master Beekeeping where it talks about how to build a candy board. Um, essentially, you just put it on top and uh, basically, and then you'd have the, um, you, you'd put it over the um, your top box and, and give them feed that way. Uh, they, uh, I guess we have yet to still check on the hives that we put the sugar boards on, uh, but they're uh, just, uh, oh, oh, gives them plenty of feed to just get them through the winter. Because I've used, we've uh, in the past invested in, in fondant and we just noticed in the spring, most of the bees didn't, no, none of the bees really touched it until maybe later in the spring, if even then. Um, so we, we, and sometimes it would come in like a very wet consistency where it was almost like melty gooey. And oh, so wow. it's not necessarily something I, we had great experience with in the, in the few years that we tried it. I the, ended up the, just taking all what was left over and melting it down into sugar syrup to use. Yeah, the, the sugar boards are more of just, it almost turns into like a hard candy. And so it, it, it's not like it's um, uh, soft or liquidy at all. And so, um, and then there, you know, it, it, uh, I think it does help to also help with moisture uh, because the moisture helps it kind of break down a little bit to make, make it easier for the bees to eat, to feed on. And um, just, we do have, go ahead. Oh no, you, you go ahead. I was okay. Gonna, I was gonna say we have we do have a few questions in the uh, the chat. Um, first one says I on my inspection tray I found a thick clear liquid. Is it fermented nectar or syrup? I guess I would say that it probably is if it is like uh like a really thick consistency. Uh. Judy, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and, and on the, by tray, do you mean the bottom board? I, I, think, I think they're referring to maybe, you know, syrup that has leaked or, um, you know, syrup that has leaked down to the bottom board and kind of hardened and thickened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've noticed uh, feed will sometimes, if you accidentally spill it, it'll do that too. And so I yeah, try to make sure not to spill your feed inside the hive. Uh, next question, uh, this time of year, uh, when you get a few uh, warm days, what kind of food are you putting in your hives to help? Um, at this moment, we're, we're doing the sugar boards, or I guess another thing we've been doing is, uh, like I guess, uh, if you are checking hives and you have dead outs, if you have uh, food stores, 
from a dead out hive, you can put that on your hive for feed. Um, for uh, Judy, what are your thoughts on pollen? I guess I've kind of heard that generally you don't feed it until the spring when you want them to start to brood and only feed about a quarter at a time. Do you think that's about correct or what are your thoughts on pollen? Feeding? For pollen in our area, um, we generally don't have to supply pollen because there's plenty of trees and spring um, pollen blooms. And you can also look, your bees will be pretty active and eager to go in the spring. You'll see bees collecting even non-pollen um, <laughs> because they're raring to go. Sometimes you'll see them collecting, you know, think things as odd as wood dust because they're so ready to collect any kind of pollens that are available. So in our area, we don't actually feed them any kind of spring pollen supplement. Because even if you do, you mix it up, you put it in there, if they've got fresh pollen, they're not going to take it. And it's just kind of a waste of your time, your money. <laughs> and exactly. it's an attractant for beetles. Yeah, yeah, it really. And we are. I'm sorry. We are oh, yes. late this year. Our pollen trees, our pollen, our major pollen source, the first ones that start are the maple trees. They didn't bloom till March 1st. And usually it's the middle of February. And so we're, Bob, where are you located already. at again, please? I'm oh, sorry, Kansas City. Oh, okay. So we're, you're a couple weeks behind us, but we're two weeks late this year. So I wouldn't be surprised if you're a week and a half or two weeks late too. Can I just show the, the candy board picture? Yeah, that'd be great. Sorry, I was trying to pull this up earlier, but this is what it looks like. Um, Right now, if we go, I think Luke will go out next week, but if we open them up, they should be kind of eating away at the sugar. Sometimes they don't eat at it and you can reuse that candy board. Here's one right here where they just eat, ate a little bit of it. We could probably still reuse that candy board. There's still a lot of good feed there. Um, but that's more, Dustin really, you know, was really good about making that and pre-making it. So there's a nice video there for, for that. So you, you made all your candy boards. You didn't order them from... Yep. Yeah, exactly. The recipe that Luke was talking about is just his video of how he, um, it's just the sugar that's cooked down and then solidifies it really into a hardened state. And it's cooked into or poured into this um, wooden frame. So it's just turned right upside down, right on top of the colony. And then that, that frame, is, does it sit on the colony with the wooden frame as, a, as like sort of yep. a shim? Okay. Yeah, so it's just a it's completely wood frame, which is easy to make yourself. And then, you know, you could wax coat it so it doesn't leak or, you know, seal it. But that that sugar hardens and it doesn't leak. Hardens solid and then the bees will eat at that. It's just a little easier to clean up for us with the you know, newspapers and all the sugar. It's a little bit easier for us to plop on these and store these two. Is the bottom a, a, a solid piece of wood on those? Yeah. And yeah. I, I did go ahead and uh, share. It's uh, from our website, Great Plains Master Beekeeping and the Bee Facts. If you go and select that link, and then underneath, uh, when should I feed bees? It does give uh, instructions on how to build a sugar board or a candy board. And then the video, I'll pop in the chat box as well. I, I just caught a glimpse of it though. Every, you folks are talking about whether it's sugar or candy board. It's definitely right now you'd be feeding a solid form of sugar as opposed to a one-to-one -one syrup or two-to-one syrup or anything like that. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's spring. I mean, it's, can you promise that it's not going to drop 40 degrees again? <laughs> As, it depends on the temperature. Like you really want it. Yeah consistently above 40 at night just to be safe because the last thing you'd want to do is freeze your bees while feeding them. But so I guess for those that are new to this sugar syrup in the liquid form um, like people will usually feed one-to-one -one sugar syrup to boost their colonies up. If it's fed too soon they'll brood up and then you risk the potential of getting brood chill because if you've got cold nights the colony clusters, and then you've got more risk of potentially causing um, mortality in your brood. So that, that's why people don't want to feed liquid syrup too quick, because 
you don't want your colony to brood up too quickly before spring is here. Other comments for people who have had bees in this area longer <laughs> have dealt with the up and down swings of spring. <laughs> Bob? Yeah. Yeah, I'm in, I mean, the Kansas City area, I've been feeding, if I needed to feed, I, I do syrup. I don't do the candy boards or the mountain man. I'm not going to put it that way. It's just, I've been doing bees for too long. But I've been doing two to one until March 1st, and then I will switch over to one to one. But I'm not feeding continuously. And I looked at the temperatures, and I think it's 60 degrees in Omaha today. And it's mm -hmm. going to be 70 for the next several days. It's warm enough you can feed syrup if you really need to. I like the idea they can take it, put it where they need it. And if you need their, I'm not continuously feeding, but if I need to give them a quart or two quarts, you know, they can take it. And that's just- For me, me our colonies, I, sorry, sorry to interrupt, no, Bob, go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say, what we would probably do is take the candy boards off, reverse them, <laughs> and then Luke will probably start prepping the syrup for it. We usually start getting feed on the end of March, beginning of April, depending on the weather. But it's yeah. really nice. It's like yeah. summer. They we skip spring, <laughs> yeah. so they might. Every year is different. That's for sure. But doing your reversals will help. And I like to do reversals too. Yeah. How are your How are your overwintering um, successes, everybody? Some of my yards, I had a hundred percent survive. Um, some of them I've lost more than I, I thought, but I, it's not more than uh, maybe 15%. And so I'm happy compared to what I'm hearing. I, I've heard a couple commercial guys that have lost a big number, like 80%. Um, and one in Kansas City and a couple in Nebraska, and it's like a little shocking. That's the case here in Iowa. The commercial folks I've talked to you have lost def certainly over 50% this winter, which made me feel better because we had pretty high losses, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Iowa and I lost 50%, five out of 10. Northeast Iowa. This is Rick in Unadilla. And we had, this is our first, first year overwintering and we lost one out of three. Good job. Yeah, it's tough. Each year is a little different, but I, I, you know, I would see it's hard to explain why you have losses some years and no losses other years. And it'll, it's kind of fun and also infuriating to try to figure it out. But I would suggest that those of you who have had really good overwintering success, just be um, cautious of your mite loads in the spring and your swarming. Because uh, that seems to be uh, things that I have noticed people are challenged with when they have good overwintering success, the following field season is challenged with high mites, um, lots of consistent mite problems, and then um, swarming. And the late swarming kind of put rooting late, and then the mite treatments aren't as effective, and then you have big losses, and it kind of rotates back and forth. Um, so just be careful. If you did have really good overwintering losses, just watch your mites and swarming. Don't gloat too much. <laughs> <laughs> but pat yourself on the back you did a great job <laughs> well the, the concerning part is the clusters are not as big as they have been in many years so but they're they're okay they'll rebound but um most of them are are medium to okay we do have a few more questions in the chat box um does anyone have a good system for weighing hives oh yeah i can um we have a cool tool that a local beekeeper uh, gave us. So we, since, since we're a university lab and we do a lot of research, especially about hive health, we've always had to weigh hives for our research projects. Typically what that was, was lift, getting someone else to help you lift the hive onto a scale uh, out in the middle of the field uh, to, to get a good weight. So that's one way is to get a traditional kind of flat scale like, a, uh, like they would use at the post office. They, they sell those. Um, but a beekeeper made us what he calls a, a tilt way, uh, which I, I have a photo of, I can share my screen. So here is my colleague, Dr. Ashley St. Clair doing a tilt way in the winter. 
Uh, this was during the polar vortex. I almost lost my fingers taking this picture. Um, but so what it is, is it's uh, this little machine um, that, that uh, and then it's got two kind of hooks on it on each end. So you get the hook under, under the hive and then you lift with, with, it's got a little bar on it. So you can lift it just halfway on one side and we do a lift on each side uh, because sometimes there's a lot of honey, more honey on one side than the other. So we'll lift each side and then add those together. And that's really nice because just one person can do it. You don't need the two people to get it on a scale. But then I, I know a lot of other beekeepers that um, just lift it with their hands on one side, you know, get their hand under the handle and try to lift it halfway to get a good idea of the heft. And they've been doing it for so long, they know what a good heavy hive feels like versus a light hive just from experience. Those are the three methods I know of. Uh, does anyone else have something else that they do? Yeah, so we could kind of use a similar method, but what, you know, as Ashley, except um, since we have a ratchet strap around our colonies, we use the fish weight scale um, <laughs> and then attach it to a post. And then we have two students just lift it up really quick and then lift it right back down, you know? And so we're not actually moving the hive on a scale. We're just kind of lifting it up and then bringing it back down. Um, but we also have, you know, the tilt method is also another way of doing it. It's, it's the same very cheap fish uh, weight scale. You know, it's got a spring. So kind of pulling it up, you can kind of get a weight on that. But yeah, it, it helps to have <laughs> lots of people to help you lift things. I like the tilt method. I think you get an average we use the brood miner, which really just is an automated weight scale for you know, research hives. But again, it's also only measuring one side of the hive. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're only looking at weight change, not really accurate weight. So, so it depends on what you're interested in knowing. Are you looking at more of a weight change or accurately what is the exact weight of your hive? So for those of you that don't know, the brood minder, it, uh, it's a little kind of flat, it's almost like a little uh, two by four sized uh, monitor that you can put under the front of your hive and then you put a two by four behind it and it sits on it. And it will, uh, you can come and use your phone, I think. Mm -hmm. And is if your phone's close with like Bluetooth technology, you, you should be able to get the, the weight check. Is that, does it use Bluetooth or do you have to take it off and bring it back to your computer? I, I don't know. No, you sync it with your phone too. And then the data is, um, you know, documented and you can set your data to record, you know, every minute, every five minutes, every 10 minutes, and you can have real time data just marking weight changes. Yeah. And they've got lots of little gadgets that you can increase, um, you know, how thorough you're looking at your hive with humidity it, monitors and temperature yeah. monitors. And things yeah, like they had that. a little temperature strip you could put in there too. Yeah. Yeah, but they can get a little bit pricey. Yeah. They even have some that are like so solar powered too and, you know, like fully automated, you know, <laughs> they can tell you everything about your hive. <laughs> Except how to keep them alive. <laughs> uh, we have another question um, from Jay. Um, if you're doing all mediums, how many would you recommend? How many? Three is equivalent to the two deeps. Mm -hmm. And then, let's see, next question. Um, let's see. Jay, did you look at the, did you already answer the question about the, the fecal stuff? The, the no, diarrhea? I, I missed no, we haven't that. looked at that yet. Yeah, um, the, the, I've been at, I've been getting a lot of questions about that too. That, you know, fecal smears or dysentery. There's a couple things that you know, you, in the winter time, sometimes you will see fecal fecal smears, and it, it's not always it's not always indicative of an issue like nosema. You know, people jump to kind of nosema that could be a, 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 a symptom of a nosema issue, but the poop issue can also be water imbalance too. So if you're feeding dry sugars, candy boards, things like that, or have moisture issues in your hives, there could be moisture imbalance issues that cause these kind of um, diarrhea issues. But right now, a lot of people are also seeing these smears and that could just be spring cleansing flights. You know, they sometimes, 
um, the media will catch on and, and say, you know, something frantically about golden showers. <laughs> but it, it's just when the bee, it's a nice spring day, the bees are all coming out and they're doing their cleansing flight and they've just been holding it in for so long. It can sometimes look a little bit brownish or darker in color. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and it can look like just a smattering and it is, it's just all the bees are coming out and being able to kind of avoid themselves right now. So don't get too worried if you see a lot of poop right now on your hives. That could just be, you know, basic spring cleaning. What are your thoughts if you're inspecting a dead out and you see a whole lot of bee poops inside the hives? Maybe there's still some food or resources in there that you would like to transfer some of those frames into one of your hives that did make it through winter. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that the risk of, if it were disease related, do you think that there's a, enough risk to keep you from reusing those frames or putting them in another hive? That's what, that's one of those hives that I would mark an X on or put a symbol on and say, look, there was diarrhea on this frame. <laughs> I don't know if it was a water issue or if it was a nosema issue, but the good thing about nosema is that colonies that are strong and, and robust in terms of their nutritional diet, they can hold off and fight high levels of nosema with no problem whatsoever. You know, so that nosema is more of a stress disease. So I, I would mark the top of that frame and, and run it through my hives. And if I consistently see issues with brood disease or spottiness, then I'm like, okay, no, maybe I need to pitch this frame next year. Yeah. I know I could show my picture now if you want. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's yeah, hard so to this, tell, this, you know, you never, you don't want to waste yeah. resources. That, that well, that's exactly so where I'm at. Yeah, Judy. So this is, my name is Mark. This is what got me here today as I reached out, checking on a dead out. I saw what I'm about to show you, which will make everybody scream and sent, I talked to my extension office that got me to Randall and he said, oh my God, that's nasty. And so invited me to this session to share this, but uh, here, let me do this. And that's exactly my question. I've got a ton of honey in here. It's a good resource. Um, but yeah, this, I've never seen anything like this. And this cluster had, they died out. I had three of my hives die out during the actual polar vortex. This now, one looks this, more like dysentery. Do you still have bees? So no, this hive died out and, and they did have a sugar brick. That's what the white is at the bottom center. Those little crumbles is it was a dried sugar brick that they ate most of. It's a two pound sugar brick. And then this hive was a swarm from the summer that I fed heavily with one-to-one -one sugar and then two-to-one sugar. So they had a lot of sugar water feed. Um, I, I feel like they had a moisture problem, even though I still had the same quilt box and everything. But yeah, when I opened this up, my other hives, I, I will see some of this streaking, you know, mm -hmm. the occasional streak or two. And that's not such a big deal or really never really worries me, but this one kind of freaked me out. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I was like, man, can I reuse this at all? Is it Nozima? Mm -hmm. Should I just burn all of this stuff and throw it away? I really don't want to, but I also don't want to take the risk of reusing it. And so, you know, I'm thinking about it's either I just gut it and throw it away or do I scrape it up, clean it up, burn it with a torch, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and, and go from there is kind of where I'm at. Or, yeah, I mean, or Randall, or Randall, as we talked about, is there a test for the nosema that can be done that I could? And if you me? still have, do you have dead bees that are in the hive and frozen, or is it cleaned off? I took a small handful of these and have them in a baggie in the freezer. Cool. Send it to us. We'll check. Who do I send it to? Uh, Luke will send you a message with our address. Yeah. I think he has. Okay. I, I don't want to give you the wrong address. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> I often do that. Yeah. Um, no, we'll check, but honestly, you know, um, I would scrape it down, give it a good clean if you want. I mean, scrape it with a hive tool, get the poop off and get as much of that, you know, yeah. that fecal stuff off and then mark those frames and, and see how they do. Cause it's hard to tell because a lot of times, and I see you've got some crystal sugar in here too. I'll, you yeah. know, it, it, like you said, you don't want to throw away perfectly usable hives because they had a stomach bug right, right, you know, that right. isn't going to be you know passed on to another hive or so but you could just send us those bees we'll see what they we see if we have um nosemo or what we have there 
Um, we're not looking for viruses or anything like that, but I would still yep. suggest that you kind of clean off what you can and mark those frames and just keep an eye on them. Yep, okay. And then to your discussion, this is what I see in several of my hives that made it through the winter. This is in the warm day, they come outside and this is outside the hive. They are very much leaving. And I, I consider this normal and a good sign or is this normal and boy, they really were on the edge of having a problem. Yeah, again, it's hard to say because we've had we've had people who have had these fecal spheres and um, you know, I, we're, and, then, and when I say we're doing nosema analysis, we're looking through the microscope. We're not doing PCR. So there's a difference right. in the methodology here. Sometimes you get false positives, sometimes you get, you know, false negatives, yeah. but um, it's hard to tell. If and this, the, this hive is alive and doing great. They're doing awesome. I'm pretty excited about them. So. Right. That's the problem is nosema is one of those things where even at high levels, some colonies do perfectly fine. And, and some colonies do very poorly at very low levels. And so, I, you know, it's hard to say definitively. Um, well, and it also depends on the type of nosema. Nosema apis is what causes the dysentery, but nosema serrana does not. Well, and there's, we haven't seen as much nosema apis in the past decade, but now that uh, antibiotics have become uh, mandatory that you get a veterinary feed directive from a veterinarian to for your hive. There's kind of been a new resurgence. Um, but, well, it, with European fowl brood especially, but uh, I feel like people are seeing more Nosema apis than they have in the past. So, um, and then I was just going to say poop. <laughs> poop outside the hive is so much better than poop inside the hive. Yeah, the hive like this one is clean. relatively clean inside. There's no problem. There's a great cluster of bees in there doing well. But on that warm day, they came out and just, you know, the top cover, everything is just covered the snow and, and always, you can, and this was right after the vortex where we had really, really long periods of cold weather, so. And what's the varroa mite level in this colony? I do not know. Sometimes that causes issues too. If, you know, if you've got high mite loads, there's issues with um, other types of diseases that they're carrying. And sometimes you'll see fecal smears and colonies that have died with visible yep. high mite loads. So, so you, know, you might want to check that too. That's something I didn't fully appreciate either. Is this, is this normal after being locked in, they come out and do this and this is a good sign that they're getting out and pooping or is this, yeah, this they really shouldn't have this much. And that's kind of a bad sign. Seen it both ways. <laughs> I don't know what other people think, but I've seen perfectly fine colonies, you know, do a lot of excessive pooping outside their hive. And then I've seen colonies that have very little fecal spheres or, you know, keep their colonies nice and clean. Um, okay, thank you. I don't know if there's a good answer to whether or not people have looked at the presence of fecal smears or the fecal smatterings and related that to disease load or, you know, health of the bees, of the colonies. Randall, do you know any poop experiments? <laughs> no, no, I don't. <laughs> I do know that uh, a lot of my hives are just covered in it right now. <laughs> yeah, the spring cleaning, the golden showers. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, sometimes you'll see really nice, healthy yellow pollens, and sometimes you'll see the dark, dark brown stains that you see in the colonies. I would say out, like Randall said, out of the hive is better. If, when you start seeing that inside the hive, it means that there was something wrong with the bees. They couldn't hold it. They, they obviously don't naturally want to poop inside their hive. So that could be a stress indicator that something was going on over the winter that made it such that they couldn't go out or they couldn't hold it like they would normally would. I would look for signs of mites, um, disease, uh, moisture issues, like if there was, you know, um, you know, mold or wetness. Um, yeah. Definitely. Um, I, and then um, William put a note saying that acetic acid solution will kill some of the nosema spores. So maybe a little wipe down. I don't know about the, the potency of the acetic acid. Is, do you find that that deters bees, the smell? Yeah, someone wants to talk about that. I've never used it. Does that mean vinegar acetic acid?
I don't know. Yeah, acetic acid and vinegar are the same thing. Just different, can be different concentration. Do you have a problem with the smell? I don't, but it's like, do you use white vinegar or apple cider vinegar or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, my friend from graduate school and colleague here in Iowa has a question that she wants to ask but with a photo that she wants to share if she can figure out how to do it on Zoom. Laurel, do you wanna go ahead and share your photo real quick before we wrap things up? Sure. So my dad, he's had bees for 10 years and it rubbed off on me. So now I have bees and I just moved them today. And uh, let me select the photo. Oh, are you on your phone, Laurel? Yeah. Are you able to share screen on a phone? Well, it says I can uh, share a photo. Are yeah, you, you can. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. So um, this is from my hive that died. And there are like most of them, I'm not showing you the cluster of them. Um, I've just been listening. So maybe they like froze out. This was a hive that from the beginning um, I ordered them and one hive did really strong all summer. And then the other one didn't and I never collected any honey off of and I just kind of treated them, but expected them to die. And um, I saw this stuff all over them. I also started to just pick out frames and inspect. And I saw a moth um, larvae on another frame, but I was just wondering what this is all over covering these bees. Well, if you have if you have wax moth larvae in there, it's going to be chewing through the wax and crudding the wax right off. Is is that what we're looking at? Is just like little pieces? Is it? I see some dots that maybe look like brass. Are the bees covered in like little pieces of wax? I, I guess I can't see that well. Maybe. I mean, I just yeah. I mean, they're covered in either. I mean, what kind of would look like a. Uh, bits of pollen or some kind of yellow yellowish dots and not all of them just kind of these ones that were at the bottom but um yeah it was just curious uh, what that might be and then i had another question um that you guys were gonna get to pretty quickly in the queue Yeah, I, I can't see it that well, but it could just be some of the, the flaking off from the wax moth damage. If I enlarge it, does it enlarge with you guys too? That does look pretty weird. Yeah, it did enlarge. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, there could be two things going on. I've seen wax debris and, you know, and it looks like, you know, especially if you see a lot in the hive and maybe even the bottom board, you might see these little wax debris. Sometimes we do, however, see, um, uh, fungal like infections or uh, uh, spores that come out of the insect and then it looks like that but they're usually not um, uh, like in things to be concerned of they're, they're more like opportunistic like pathogens that might have just okay. taken it could have just taken over the dead bee you know itself um, so yeah. it could be something related to a microbe or a pathogen yeah so sometimes you see mold growing from the bees. Oh, interesting. Well, and, and Judy knows a lot about dead bees. Which oh. is <laughs> dead bee boards. Yeah. <laughs> and then my one that survived um, is super heavy. So I had it at one location and we moved um, and kind of wanted to, it was in a location where it wasn't going to be easy with the snow and then when the snow melted and then like reformed in to ice to get down to them until recently. So today I moved them and the dead hive was like super light. And then I was expecting the other one to be pretty light, but it turned out to be like really, really heavy. So uh, I was asking 
my friend Randall earlier, like what that was about. And he thought maybe moisture. I haven't popped it open to look, but do, I mean, would that be like a good thing or like something concerning that they would be that heavy? I mean, it looked like there was lots of bees in there. Um, I didn't open them all the way up. I just kind of like lifted the top. I don't know all the lingo, but the top part up mm -hmm. and then there was like a board with like a, like a top board, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I didn't open that up, but I saw lots and lots of bees and I could hear them buzzing and stuff like that. It sounds like you might need to reverse the colonies. They might've just, you know, kind of moved up to that second box and then not really eaten a lot of the reserves on the bottom. So you probably have a hundred pounds of honey on the bottom box and you know, if you flip All it right. over, then they'll do, you know, you'll have an extra feed. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, I will. Uh, so wait, it sounds like you wait until a warm day. Uh, Randall was saying Sunday is supposed to be pretty warm. So that might be a good day to swap them. I'd say so. All right. Well, I know what I'll be doing Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's after six. If you guys have more questions or need another opportunity to talk about spring prep, um, the the Nebraska Beekeepers Association second Tuesday seminar is next. Is it next week? Um, on Tuesday evening, we do we have another informal Q and A just about spring pet prep, but more specifically um, equipment things. Um, so we invited uh, Warren. Nelson from Valhalla Beef, and he is kind of the um, bee supplier in our area and gets a lot of questions. It'd be nice to kind of pick his brain about what issues people are having and, and maybe some, um, some of his thoughts on some equipment pluses and minuses. I mean, there's so much out there, so much new stuff too. It's uh, nice to kind of connect with him every once in a while to see what's useful and what's not, what's excess. So you can look on their um, Facebook page for more information. Randall, do you have any other announcements or um, things coming up? Um, I think people saw in the email I sent out last week about this happy hour that um, there's also Michigan uh, Beekeepers Association is, is having an event. I, I, it started on Wednesday, but I think that they are still gonna have speakers through tomorrow. So that would be another thing that folks could check out if they were interested. Cool. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks, Have a Randall. great weekend and yeah. enjoy checking on your bees this weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for hosting this, folks. It was informative. Yeah, thank you. See you in a month. <laughs> Take care. Have a nice Bye. weekend.